Good morning, church. And happy Sabbath. Are you happy to be here? Amen. Amen. If we can get the present, that one slide ready, but when I give you the cue. This morning, we are continuing uh, well, with the theme of this weekend, of the resurrected Jesus Christ. But before we do, before we begin, I need to bring something out to the light. I need to bring something out to the open, to the church, as your pastor. <clears throat> some of us may be aware, some of us may not be aware, but two of our fundamental beliefs are being questioned, if not attacked, amongst ourselves. The eternal existence of Jesus Christ and the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. As you may remember, we just studied about the Holy Spirit last quarter. Wonderful Sabbath school lesson, study on that. These attacks are not new to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, if you've been in the church long enough and if you've kept up with Adventist history, you've known that, that these attacks uh, on these doctrines are not new. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church has shown through Scripture and Spirit of Prophecy what we believe and why we believe it. And we may hear from this congregation other ideas, but the reason why I'm bringing this up, church, is because I do not want you to be deceived. God has led his church in the past and will continue to lead his church. We may not be perfect Christians. There may be flaws and errors in the organization, in the leaders, but the theology of this church is as solid as a rock. Amen. Amen. This church, the Cleveland First Seventh-day Adventist Church, stands on our fundamental beliefs, which include the eternal existence of Jesus Christ, who never had a beginning has, and has always existed with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And we stand on the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Trinity of the Godhead. This is where Scripture stands, and this is where we stand. And I'd just like to share a quote from here, Desire of Ages, and we can, if, if we can put that up, I'm sorry, from Acts of the Apostles, Page 52. Here, God's prophet for his church, for his end time, end time church, to help us. She tells us the nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. Friends, we will never understand the Holy Spirit or God 100% in our futile, sinful, carnal minds. Can somebody explain to me on how Jesus became a person, was incarnated into the womb of Mary? No medical doctor can even explain that. We believe it because God says so. And by faith, there are fundamental beliefs that we know, but we cannot understand 100%. And so she says, the nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Man cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. Man having... Fanciful views may bring together passages of Scripture and put a human construction on them, but the acceptance of these views will not strengthen the what? The church, friends. God's last prayer request was that the church be one, that we may be, that we may be united. There is no time to be chasing rabbit holes and other ideas from other places. These will not strengthen the church. Regarding such mysteries, which are too deep for human understanding, amen, she says, silence is what? Is the key. Thank you. That's all I need for the slide. And so, friends, I appeal to you. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is exactly how I feel, how Paul was writing to the Corinth church. This is... What Paul here is writing I, is exactly how I feel toward you. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Here Paul says, Oh, that you may bear with me a little. And indeed you have, and, and indeed you do bear with me. And I thank you, church, 
for bearing with me as your pastor. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband that I present you as chaste, as a chaste virgin to Christ. Friends, my goal and desire is for every single person to be in the kingdom with God. And I, have, and I am a jealous pastor when things or someone try to remove you from God's church. For I, am a je- for I am jealous for you. I want you to be in the kingdom of God and see Jesus face to face. Verse 3 says, But I fear least, lest, least somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted or deceived from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaching another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you received a different spirit from which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. For I consider that I am not at all inferior, and I don't myself. I do not consider myself better than anyone else. Even though I am untrained in speech, and I don't consider myself the greatest preacher either, yet I am not, I am not untrained in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest through you in all things. And so friends, I just appeal to you. God has led his church. Hold fast to the Bible, to the fundamental beliefs of this church. May God bless you and let's have a word of prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, you have warned us and told us that things like this would occur. And we hold on to you. And although there may be other issues and problems in your church, we know that what we hold fast in our fundamental beliefs, Lord, you have led us to these teachings. Be with us as we open scripture this morning and continue in the blessed resurrection of your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All righty. Now if you open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Verse 16. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, the Bible says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may, what? Freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. God is giving a a command. He's not a suggestion, he says a command. Don't eat from it. You can eat from everything else, but this tree, don't eat from it. For the day that you do, you will surely die. And unfortunately, and unfortunate is an understatement, but what happened? Adam and Eve ate from the fruit. And so if you look at chapter 3, verse 9, it says, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, why? No, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you? You shall not eat. God is comparing what he says to what Adam did. He's, 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 God is examining obedience. Obedience is part of the Christian walk. Amen. God is calling Adam. Adam, God knew where Adam was. And God knows where each one of us are. And he still calls us. And Adam says, I, I, was, I was hiding because I was naked. And what did God say? Who told you? Did you do what I asked you not to do? What I commanded you not to do? He's examining Obedience. Obedience is part of the Christian walk. And, and we see here the fall 
of man in sin. But sin did not originate here. Sin did not originate with Adam and Eve eating from the fruit. Where did sin originate? Who can tell me? In heaven. If you remember Revelation chapter 12, Michael and his angels are fighting against Satan and his angels. And war began in heaven. War began in heaven. Sin originated in heaven. And sin is a direct attack against God. Against God. You see, sometimes we view sin as just poor judgment or a bad choice. But sin is a direct attack against God. And God had to let Satan carry out sin. Because what did sin end up doing? Nailing Jesus on the cross. A direct attack against God. Satan wasn't happy until he attempted to kill God. That is sin. That is sin. If, if God were to allow us to live forever in a sinful condition, our attempt eventually would be, would be to kill God. It is a direct attack against God. Calvary shows us what sin leads to. So when you think of a little sin, a little sin, it would be a little attempt. Even a little attempt to kill me or to attack me, does that mean you use a little gun or a little knife? You're still going to attack me and kill me. It doesn't matter if it's a little attempt or a big attempt, a little sin or a big sin. Sin is sin. And sin put Christ on the cross to die. My little sin, whether it be bad words and a potty mouth or a big sin and you can figure out whatever you want that big sin to be every sin put christ on the cross christ did not die because of the lashes of the whips of the blood of the spear he did not die of that when you read the the story of jesus there in gethsemane the soldiers had not put a finger on him yet, and he's stumbling. He's sweating blood. Why? They haven't touched him. What's killing him? What's beginning to drain the life from him? It is my sin and your sin. The sins of my parents and my grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-great. The sins of my children, and if they have children, their children. All oh, that sin put into one man. That is how terrible sin is, friends. We killed God. We killed God. Sin is, no matter how big or small, sin is a direct attack against God. And when we silence or remove God from our lives, we are directly attacking Him. Directly attacking Him. You see, to sin against God means that you are cooperating then with Satan. There is no in-between ground. Jesus Himself says, He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me, what does He do? Scatters. So if we do not lean toward God, then that means we're leaning toward the enemy. And we're cooperating with Satan. And, and, and that's exactly what Adam and Eve did. They cooperated with Satan. Paul in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that Satan is a god of this world. Satan is a god of this world. And, and that's why he tells us, do, do, do not love the things of this world. Because Satan is the God of the ruler of this world. Our God is not from here. Our God came, died, and resurrected, and is in heaven, and is preparing a place for you and me. And he's told us that. We are just, as, a, as, as the hymn says, we are just a passing through. I'm just a poor, wayfaring stranger, just a passing through. This is not our home. 
It was our home, but our first parents gave it over to Satan. And Satan became the king, the prince, the god of this world. But there's good news, friends. Now, I praise the Lord. As much as it hurts that I killed Jesus on the cross, I was part of it. Praise the Lord that somebody, that God came to die for my sins. Only, only God could die for the sins. An angel couldn't do it because it was sin, the Bible says, is a transgression against what? The against the law. And the law is a character, is, is, is the character of God. So when we break the law, only the law giver, the, the equal with the law, could come and represent and die. An angel couldn't do that, but God himself did. And showing him how much he loves you and me. And was then the death of Christ sufficient for us? With the death of Christ all that we need? The death of Christ paid the penalty of sin. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus paid that penalty. Rome, there in Romans 6, 23. But if you open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15, where we had our scripture reading. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to share with you this morning that the death of Jesus, praise the Lord for the pardoning of our sins, but was insufficient without the resurrection of Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. Are we there? For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to what? Scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And that he was seen. And notice what Paul does here. Paul just could have said he resurrected according to the scriptures and ended. But that's not enough. Notice what he does. And that he was seen by who? Then by the twelve. After that he was, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. Of whom the greater part remain for the present. But some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. What is Paul's, why is Paul bringing these, these testimonies that they saw Jesus, the, re, the resurrected Jesus? Why is that important? To give evidence that Jesus is not in the tomb. That no one can say, well, the scriptures say that, but I don't know if that's actually... Or Paul could have been making... No, Paul is saying, go ask those 500 men. Go ask Cephas. Go ask James. Go ask all those eyewitnesses that Jesus is resurrected. That Jesus is resurrected. For evidence. And notice verse 11. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so we believe... Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no, it, but if there is no resurrection, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is what? Is in vain. It's no good. If Christ is not risen, friends, we can just pack up and leave right now. Christianity stands because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christianity is the only religion that can back up with actions of a risen leader and risen savior. Every other religious leader that, that exists in the world, they may have been good teachers and good philosophers and good counselors, but they are buried 
in their graves. Jesus was more than a good teacher and a good philosopher. He is the giver of life. And because he died and was resurrected, friends, that gives ground and the foundation and the pillar for Christianity and power to the Christians, power to the believe in Christianity. Verse 13, and if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is also vain. Yes, and we are found false witness of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. In verse 16, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And here's the key verse. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is no good, it's futile, and you are still where? Does a resurrected Christ have a lot to do with our sins? It has uh, everything to do. Then you are still in your sins. You are still in your sins. Romans chapter, chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verse 10. Friends, we are not just forgiven of our sins, but cleansed of our sins because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5, verse 10, the Bible says, for if, we, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. By his resurrection life, resurrected life. The resurrection provides power to live the godly life. The, the only way that we can walk the Christian walk is because of a resurrected Savior. If Christ had not risen, then that means that he had no power over death. No power over sin. Remember, sin killed them. The wages of sin is death. And sin killed him. And if he did not, wouldn't have resurrected, he had no power over sin. So how can I have power over sin if Jesus didn't have power over sin? But because Jesus did, and he resurrected, and he, and he even there, Paul, Paul says, oh, death, where is your sting? You have nothing on me. And Jesus in, in one place said that, that's the, that the devil has nothing on him. Wouldn't you like to say those words? To live the life and say, the devil has nothing on me. Because I cling to the resurrected power of the resurrected Jesus Christ. Because Jesus resurrected that power we too can walk like he walked we too can live like he lived you see god has high standards god has high standards and his and his standards have never changed amen we live in an age where we try to change god's standards and we try to say well god understands yeah, he understands that you're not doing what he told you to do. Amen. Amen. God tells us, return tithe. If we're unhappy with what's happening in the church, God is not interested in how we feel about that. He says, return tithe and offering. Keep my Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother. Have no other gods. Have me first. If you don't love me more than your mother and father, you're not worthy of me. God has high standards, friends. Walk a holy life. But those standards are too high. And I wasn't born with a mind to keep up with God's standards. And I can, and I can even say, neither were you. So what do we need? We need help. And that help comes the resurrected body, the resurrected proof of a risen Savior. The help comes from the resurrected life of Jesus. There is resurrected life in the Word of God. If you turn to John chapter 6, we see 
that this resurrected life is in the word. John chapter 6. That's why the devil does so much good work in keeping us from studying and spending time in his word. Because he knows that there is power in this book. John chapter 6 verse 51. Jesus says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews, therefore, quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most surely I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink the blood, you have no life in you. Notice verse 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are what? They are life. There is resurrected life in the Word of God. And that's why the devil does everything to discourage us or keep us busy that by the end of the day, we're so tired that we forgot to open the Bible to open the Sabbath school lesson, to have any communion with God. And if, and if he gets you one day, he says, one day less, they didn't spend time with God. And he'll do it again and try and try every day. And so, friends, because Christ resurrected, turn with me to Colossians. Turn with me to Colossians. Because Christ resurrected, and that power that he resurrected, he offers it to us. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Are you there? I'm already there. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Raised with Christ, how? I mean, we're still here, so it must not be talking about the second coming. If you were raised with Christ, Christ was raised on the third day. And we were raised with him, especially when we partake in baptism, which represents death, burial, and a what? A resurrection. If we are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is. Where Christ is. Romans 6. Here's another way that Paul put it. Turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. There is power in the blood, friends. And there is power in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that power is available for us. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead, there it is. Was he raised? Amen. Amen. By the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in what? Newness of life. Just how Jesus was resurrected. And because he was resurrected, so also we now have, through Jesus Christ, the same power to walk a new life. That's why Jesus says you've got to be born again. Because our first birth is selfish, is, is greedy. It's evil. We need to be born again, resurrected. A perfect example here of through baptism. The power to live a holy life, a godly life, is attainable, friends, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. Christ isn't coming. Pay attention. Christ is not coming to save anyone. Christ is coming to collect the saved. There's a difference. Christ is not coming to save everyone, but to collect the saved. Didn't he, didn't he say in Revelation 22, verse 12, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to their works. He's coming with the rewards already. He's already de determined. He's already seen your life. 
He, he already knows who's saved and who's not. He's not barely coming to determine, well, who's going to be saved? No. He's got the rewards already. Based on, the Bible says, their works. Now, this may confuse you, but I think you're smart. We are not saved by works. Amen. Amen. We are not. But we are not saved without works. Right. Amen. Amen. We are not saved because I keep the Sabbath, so I'm in the kingdom. No. But we are not saved without it. Just think of a relationship. I do not give good gifts to my wife or I'm faithful to her and do good works because I'm going to get paid for it or I might get a meal at the end or... No. I do those good works out of love. Whether she responds or not, it is my love that gives the good works. It is our love to Jesus that we do the good works. It is a love to Jesus that we keep the Sabbath because, Lord, you want to spend time with me? I am unworthy, but thank you. Absolutely, I will dedicate a whole day for you. It is our love for him. We are not saved by our works, but we cannot be saved without it. And there, Revelation 22, verse 12, and there are other verses that he's coming to give quick. He, I am, he's coming quickly and his reward to give those to everyone according to their works. He is coming to collect those who are being transformed by his resurrected life. And it is possible for a sinful person to portray the character of Jesus. It is possible. Only by putting our faith in the, resurrected, in the resurrection of Jesus. If you look at your meditation there, taken from testimonies to the church, it says God leads his people on step by step. Don't miss that, friends. A Christian walk is a step. It's not a jump. It's not a leap. It's called the Christian walk. Not the Christian sprint. The walk. God leads his people step by step. And so that's why I must say, as each one of us are walking with Jesus, some may be behind over there. Some may be over there. You don't worry how they're walking with Jesus or how they're walking with Jesus. You just walk with Jesus and worry about your own walk. Amen? Everyone is walking with Jesus at different stages of their life. Keep your eyes only in yourself and your relationship with God. God leads his people on step by step. The Christian life is a constant battle and a march. There is no rest from the warfare it is by constant, unceasing effort that we maintain the victory over the temptations of Satan, friends. We do not need to battle. We do not need to fight the devil how Jesus fought the devil. We don't. Jesus already overtook him. The devil is a beaten dog. He is overcome he's a defeated angel a defeated enemy jesus already beat him all we have to do is cling to the fight that jesus fought for us cling to his resurrection and 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 only through his resurrection we have the power to continue in this christian walk do we want that life do we want the life a powerful life of walking the Christian walk? Or do we just want a decent life? I can tell you that Jesus didn't die to give you a decent life. You don't need Christ to be a decent person. There are many decent atheists. Many serve Satan and are decent. They don't rob banks, they don't rape, they don't kill. They're polite, they go to work, they open the door to people, they're good neighbors, but yet they have nothing to do with God. But they're decent people. 
I don't need God to be a decent person, but I do need God to live a life above sin. And you and I need God to live a life above sin. Anyone can be a decent person and know that you open the door to a lady. You say, thank you. Yes, ma'am. No, sir. God has called us to live a life above sin. And the life above sin is the life of Christ. Do you want that life, church? Does it, does it excite you to know that you can live a life above sin? Does it excite you to, that you can live a life of no sin? Or do you think that, like, no, no, that's... Philippians 4.13, a verse that most of us know. I can do all things. What does all things mean? Everything. 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 I can keep God's commandments. But not by myself. I can do all things through Christ. And his power of the resurrection because he gives me the strength. He gives me the power to do it. He gives me the power to do it. And so this morning I actually want to appeal and ask. Does anyone feel, or maybe I should say the opposite. Is there anyone who does not feel the need for Christ? And you're thinking, I don't, I don't see what the big deal is. I'm doing just fine. Is there anyone? I'm not, I'm not trying to pick on somebody specific. No, no, no. But friends, it is, you are in mortal danger. Mortal danger. I don't know how many remember that video game, maybe you don't, called Mortal Kombat. What kind of combat? What does mortal mean? What, what does moral mean? You, 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 you just get knocked out? No. The game would even say, if you didn't, you know, you would be fighting there, the other opponent, and he's still kind of awake. I, you know, the, the, the computer game is still in my mind that it would say, finish him. Mortal means done. It is a, you are in mortal danger to think that you do not need Jesus. Amen. To think that you, do, that you are doing just fine. And if there's anyone here who feels that I'm doing just fine, I, I, I really don't need Jesus. While we're singing, while we are singing our closing hymn, I want you to come and I want to meet with you here. I want, I want to share with you the dangers that you are unaware of living a life without Jesus. Is the life of Jesus going to be always sunshine and roses? No, it's not. But it is a blessed and happy life. A life of peace. And you need the resurrected life of Jesus Christ to sustain you. To sustain you. And so search this church how many this morning want to pray to the Father and say, Lord, I want the resurrected power of Christ in my life. Amen? Amen? Lord, I need power. I need that resurrected power when I go online. Lord, I need that resurrected power when I turn on the radio. Lord, I need that resurrected power to be faithful to my spouse. Lord, I need that resurrected power to keep my mouth shut because it's so, Lord, I need that resurrected power because by myself I can't do it. But you have promised that I can do all things through your son, Jesus Christ, who gives me the strength. And praise the Lord that he gives us the strength because he had power to be resurrected and that power is available for you and for me. How many want to pray, Lord, I need that power and you fill in the blank. You, you know, and I know, what we need. Divine power. Lord, I need that resurrected power 
as I date this person, as I go out to eat, what, you fill in the blank, you know yourself. Anybody need and want to ask the Lord for that resurrected power? If that is your desire, I appeal and invite you to stand. I appeal and invite you to stand. God sent his son and they called him Jesus. He came to love, to heal, and to forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty tomb is there to prove that my Savior lives. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know that he holds the future and life is worth a living, friends, because Jesus resurrected and is alive today. My heart goes out to anyone who is, feels they do not need Jesus Christ. If you feel that way as we sing this song and you want to come here, come. And church, if somebody is trying to move to the pews, let's cooperate and don't hinder the Holy Spirit. It is a mortal danger to live without Jesus. It doesn't matter where you are, if you're in the balcony, if you're in the sound booth, if you're in the kitchen, if you can hear my voice. If you, don't, if you feel that you're fine without Jesus, I want to just meet with you for one minute. I'm not going to beat you over the head. No. But come as we sing our closing hymn. Because He lives because he lives i can face tomorrow and because he lives we can overcome sin and we can walk the christian walk so let's open our hymn books as we sing 526 526 because he lives sent his son they called him Jesus he came to love heal and forgive he lived and died to buy my pardon an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. 